this is a really important topic um, to hear, and, and I can give a testament to it. I like Jennifer. I'm a nerd. Um, I love diving into the science behind things as well as the policy. And so when we were, I used to work for the state of Texas, um, ran disaster recovery operations um, for a couple decades. Um, and so when our team was getting ready to start our CDBGDR program after Hurricane Harvey um, and our 2016 events and our 2015 events, um, all that DR funding we wanted to make sure was well spent and it was being put into mindful ha built houses. Um, so I asked uh, for permission. We sent a bunch of our staff out to the facility so they could learn, and they all came back super excited. Um, and then our builders hated us because we said, change order, number one. Um, you're now going to put nails closer. You're going to use these specific nails, and you're going to put roof decking tape down because what we learned from them improve the houses that we're building for our disaster survivors so they don't have to come back to us the next time there's an event um, because we're making those homes more resilient and mitigating against future events. And so that's something I'm super passionate about. And so I'm glad to share the stage today and I'm gonna let y'all introduce yourselves and really the show is yours. All right, hey everyone. Amanda West, IBHS. I spent 20 years before coming to IBHS at the Weather Channel going to hundreds of disasters um, from hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, um, all of it. Uh, and I, <clears throat> someone mentioned it earlier, wildfire is different. It's, it's so much worse. Um, not to, you know, again, it's, it's all bad. Um, so I'm happy to be here today. And um, after going to all those disasters, uh, I knew I needed to do something before the disaster happens, not, you know, trying to help people through it afterwards. And so I found IBHS, um, and we are a nonprofit research facility. If you don't know who we are, um, you can go to IBHS.org and see exactly what we do um, from wind, uh, wind, wind-driven rain, hail, and wildfire. Um, so we have, after um, a few years, we, um, after 10 years of research, um, on wildfires, and, and even more than that, like going into the field to see exactly what happened, um, and then taking it back to our research facility, um, we decided to launch wildfire, uh, wildfireprepared.org. And so we'll learn a little bit more about that, and I will let Mark introduce himself. Um, there you go, Mark. <laughs> Everyone, my name's Mark Vaughn. I run the Wildfire Prepared Home Program uh, on the operational side uh, with IBHS. And uh, I'll turn. Oh. Yeah, so my background, I spent about 15 years in the insurance industry. I insured primarily commercial uh, properties. Uh, garage insurance is my primary part of my book. And uh, they told me I couldn't ride anymore in Louisiana. And I left and started building houses. So I uh, worked for Habitat for Humanity in uh, the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain, North New Orleans. I ran two different affiliates, uh, construction programs there, built dozens of houses, uh, and with wildfire or, or with hurricane uh, in mind. And that's when I became aware of IBHS. I built uh, fortified um, construction, fortified roofs. I was a fortified professional uh, on their, their training. And when my wife and I decided to move out west, I was going to build to the uh, you know, the risk that was out here in wildfires, so I started researching it and, and found that IBHS had some research on that as well. And uh, ended up that they ended up hiring me to run the program after I asked a lot of questions. So, <laughs> and here we are today. All right. So, uh, we launched the program in June of 2022, and it is a wildfire mitigation program. We launched it in the state of California. Um, and it is basically a program in which homeowners know exactly what to do and how to do it. Um, we have lots of research. We know that embers travel. They travel into communities. They're usually the first things that come into communities, um, which then lead to flames um, around and on structures and then radiant heat. So we knew we, knew we needed to do something about that. Uh, so we came back to the research facility and we tested building materials. 
um, and, and how these embers affected each of the buildings. Um, we have ember generators that we can blow at homes uh, in order to see what the, what the, what, how the embers affect the built environment. Uh, we do structure to structure uh, fire research. We do fuel breaks, um, different types of building materials. I've said um, we know that embers can be anywhere from, you know, this small to this big. These are some 3D printed embers. Um, this is vegetative embers. Once a home catches on fire, the embers get bigger than this. So we know we need to do something about that. So we know that we're not powerless. We are not powerless against wildfire. We know what we need to do. We've created this system of actions. It's not just one thing. It's not just two things. It is a whole system of actions that homeowners need to take in order to keep the ember intrusion from igniting the home. The whole point of this product that we've created, and we're a nonprofit, we're not trying to sell anything, we just want people to build stronger. Um, and the whole point is to keep the flames away from the homes. Keep them, keep the embers from igniting things and embers away from the home. Um, so that's how we, how we created this program. So has anybody in here heard of the zero to five foot non-combustible zone? It was no accident how this, how we discovered this. These are our ember generators and we, we have 105 industrial size fans on one side of our nine story building and we can blow winds up to 150 miles an hour. Um, at, and we can rotate this house. It's on a turntable. We can, you know, we can do all of that. Uh, and we have ember generators and we see what happens in a real wildfire with real winds um, at different um, speeds and directions, all of that. Um, so this is, what we know that embers, when they hit a home, they're gonna fall down and bounce out to five feet. So that's where the zero to five foot non-combustible zone came about. Um, also, you can see right at the edge of the building there, uh, they also accumulate right there. So that's why another um, one of our base requirements is that the bottom six inches of the home needs to be non-combustible material. So that could be the, the foundation, the concrete foundation, um, it could be non-combustible siding, um, such as fiber cement board, um, brick, stone, something like that. Um, a lot of that's in California building code. Modern code, um, due to water and termites, um, so it's already there um, for modern building codes. All right, so this is our, the base level. So this is where you, you have to start the mitigation from here. This is uh, for ember uh, defense. So we've got, um, I wanna start actually with the roof. You wanna have a class A roof, gutters. If you even have gutters, not every ha home has gutters. Uh, make sure that they're metal material um, and then keep the maintenance, keep them cleaned out. Defensible space, uh, the zero to five, as I mentioned, and then five to 30. Five to 30, we know um, we wanna break the connective fuels. And then over here, the building features, vents. We all know the vents are important, the eighth inch or finer metal mesh, which you can buy a roll, a roll of that mesh from Amazon for like 80 bucks and cover your whole house, all the vents in your house. Um, the six inch at the base of the wall, non-combustible, and then decks. We know that uh, decks are another vulnerable uh, component. So this is basically one of the demonstrations that we show a lot. Um, we were just at the Ember Stomp last weekend in Marin County and did a demo where we, um, the right side is uh, the non-combustible five foot zone and then um, a <clears throat> wildfire prepared home. And then on the left side is just a, typ a, typ a typical home that you would see. And we've got mulch, we've got trees, we've got a fence. And all we did was light the mulch on fire. That could be an ember this big, this big, that landed in the mulch. And it will smolder and it will spread and it will ignite the fence, the bushes, and 
anywhere along that fence and you will eventually, you know, create that pathway right to the house itself. So I can't um, stress the importance of the zero to five foot non-combustible zone. And I know homeowners do not want to take their bushes out or their, fit, their privacy fence out, but that is, if there's any takeaway today, it's that. So here's another, just another example of uh, the five to 30 foot defensible space. And again, um, no five foot non-combustible zone and then the five to 30 feet of connective fuels. We know that like if you have a shed, a tree, a fence, a hot tub, all of those things all together and it leads that pathway of fire right to the house. We've got to spread these things out as far away from the house as possible. So what do we do about this? What about in our built environment already? We've got to take that vegetation out in between the homes, just taking out that five feet of a wood fence. We've also got uh, manufacturers who are selling their products. Oh, well, it's, it's a vinyl fence. It's fire resistant. It's fire resistant to what? A, you know, a cooking on your grill next to it, but not in a wildfire. It's still going to burn. So it's education. It's, it's, you know, informing homeowners that this is, these are the actions that they need to take. So the base, the base level of the program, that's easier to get to in a retrofit. Having homeowners do that at a minimum, just doing those things against ember entry. And then on the plus side, this is the home hardening. Once you, um, if you are building new, it's easier to get to this because it's gonna be a little bit more expensive to get to this if you're trying to rip off the siding that you already have. If you're trying to, um, if you're trying to change off the windows in your home to double pane tempered windows. So if you do this on new construction, you're gonna, you're gonna bend down that, that risk curve. All right, so um, that's kind of where, where, where I wanted to go with this. Um, if there's any questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. And, um, you know, I, when I first started looking at this, I thought, how is this possible, right? Like, how can people afford this? How is it, are, are people going to be able to, what do HOA say about it? And I'll tell you, I moved from Texas to North Carolina recently and, um, their test facility is in South Carolina, so they can attest to it. And anyone who's been in that part of the country can attest. Everybody out there likes to put, instead of mulch, dried pine needles. And it literally made my skin crawl the minute I saw that. That is an instant flame. And we had more wildfires in North Carolina than I could count this summer because we were in extreme drought. And I am the person, literally last Friday, just finished um, a total of nine cubic yards of stone where I ripped out all of the mulch and I ripped out all the shrubs and I put stone around my house and luckily my fence was already made of a brick wall and we had a metal gate so I didn't have to do the fencing but there we put in brand new gutters with leaf guard and things like that and the neighbors are like oh that looks really nice and I'm like I'm doing it for a reason and so I sit and I educate all my neighbors why what they're doing in their yards is bad. And then they look at me like I'm the crazy new, new neighbor and they don't talk to me anymore. But hopefully I put something in someone's mind um, that they need to fix things. Um, so if I'm a homeowner, this seems overwhelming at first. What are those first steps I can take? What's realistic? How can I achieve this? You know, that, that first five feet is the, the first thing that we look for. Uh, it's the easiest to check uh, remotely. You can look at photos and tell very easily, a lot more easily than checking the vents on the house, for example. So starting there, just, and rem, I, I try not to use the word remove, just move them. You know, you don't have that, you can have plants. You can have a beautiful landscape. We just want that five feet of the fire break, if you will, against the house. So, and we're, you know, humans, we're, we're terrible at depth perception. Um, if you move those plants five feet away from your house, now you can walk around your house and make sure that there's not pests and bugs next getting into your house. 
from the street, nobody can tell the difference. That looks the same as if the, the hedge was right against the wall when they drive by. So it, it does take effort, it does take time, it takes money, um, but that is a low-hanging fruit. You can do this in a couple of weekends uh, on sweat equity. And then you can actually get to the vents and things that you need to do to maintain your home. And I also made the argument to folks that it helps with people breaking into my house. If you have shrubs up against your house, people can hide behind shrubs and get into your... So, like, if that wasn't motivating people enough, I was trying to bring up other She's reasons going with why fear. I do it. <laughs> I'm instilling fear in all my neighbors. Um, any other, you know, Mark, from a, a building and standpoint, any other thoughts for folks on ways they can kind of mitigate and just think about their homes in general and, and practices they can build, and especially as a lot of communities here are starting that rebuilding process before you start to rebuild, um, how, do you, how do you infuse that early on? Yeah, we, we're pretty much out of time, but the, um, the, the, go to the website, welfarepair.org, look at PLUS. If you're gonna rebuild, that really is, is it's incremental cost. You're already putting windows in. Um, make them double pane tempered, as opposed to just double pane. Uh, annealed glass. It's an incremental cost up front. If you were to replace all your windows and existing, it's much more expensive. So keep that in mind. Um, and yeah, uh, our goal, I've told Jennifer this, you know, if, if we're successful, then we don't have after the fires anymore, right? And I think we'd all be happy with that, so. And there, there is one thing, I, I did bring this in here. There are some materials that um, we go a little bit above and beyond Chapter 7A. Um, there are some materials that um, that we've tested and we know that um, are a little bit more vulnerable than others, even though they are in that building code. And one of them is the siding material. This is fiber cement. This is, what is this called? Wood, wood a, fiber. It, it basically, there's, there's products that look like fire. They're made to look like wood. Both they of them are made to look like wood. The same from the outside. One actually is wood. And one's made of a non-combustible material. It's, it's made of wood. Um, but the sheathing behind it is what keeps it Chapter 7A compliant. Um, but we know that in a wildfire, fire's coming from the outside, not the inside. Um, so it makes a difference in the type of material that you choose. We run into a lot of people that are sold stuff because salesmen will tell you anything. Um, and yeah, like Amanda was saying, you know, vinyl fences are non-combustible, which we know that that's not true, but they're told that all the time. So um, the class A ratings, the different ratings of materials, uh, there are certain ways that those tests are performed. Uh, and actually items that melt tend to perform very well as far as a rating goes because they can't survive the entire test. So there are some materials that hit ratings that we just can't accept because they, they you know, the, the physics of the test don't work out for that to actually end up with that, so. Right, it's not just, tested for wildfire, it's just tested for fire. Um, but that's what IBHS does. We're, you know, a building science organization and trying to perform some, some good um, testing to give you guys more resilient housing and survive uh, disasters. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Appreciate it.